Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Hi, everybody. I was reading an article about thriftiness and frugality. Is it frugality or frugal? Just plain frugal. Anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it had me thinking about this um, this idea that disposable stuff is primarily an American thing. And um, Ronald Goldsmith, who is a consumer psychologist, says the U.S. is the most wasteful country in the world. More than a quarter of Americans are shopping online at least once a week. And Giles Slade says that not only did Americans invent disposable products ranging from diapers, cameras, contact lenses, but we invented the very concept of disposability itself. So I went trotting off to my European husband and said, of all the places that you've lived, (laughs) talking about you, dear, (laughs) um, how has it been different in terms of having disposable things, um, keeping things uh, for a long time versus changing them out often. And um, so one of the first things you told me was about redecorating. So tell us the story about how it's different here about redecorating and um, that it is in Europe. I mean, it's a kind of a different approach. Well, once again, there's some white around here. So what I'm telling you is <laughs> from when I lived there, you see. Uh, which so, has been some time. Yes, which has been a little bit over a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> a year or 20. Yes, yeah, a year Five, or 20 or something. Or 30. And that is simply <laughs> that uh, I remember a house or, or even an apartment would simply get decorated uh, the moment somebody moved in. And there was was it a little family or or like somebody downsizing, you know, uh, like grandma losing her house and going into an apartment. Uh, and that's when people would think about the wallpaper, would think about uh, lamp lampshades and other things. And then not anymore. End of story. I mean, uh, uh, one reason why Europe, Central Europe, to a certain uh, um, extent seems to be charming uh, to Americans uh, is because uh, every house is sort of put in place once and that's it and decorated and that's it. I remember growing up and, and visiting friends and so on. You could tell, oh, you know, not, not that anybody cared, but you could tell that somebody moved in here in the 1950s, somebody moved in here in the 1960s, you know, and whoa, you know, and, uh, and here they moved in the 70s and, and so on. and that's it. I, I remember also when when youngins uh, leave the house, uh, usually the only piece of furniture taken with is maybe a desk that they used for schoolwork at home or, or a chair or, or something else or something that parents could miss. Okay, you, you take this, okay? And like uh, my older brothers, the one built his own house and left the interior for a long time mainly empty mainly empty uh because they knew there was furniture coming their way eventually you know and and other things so there's no point in in (laughs) by which you mean inheriting yes that he would inherit yes but that's interesting but also my parents then would shed things they would say hey now you have your own house okay and and you know don't live here anymore we don't need this big dining room set for the whole family to sit around you're starting your own family off you go you take this and we'll use the card table or we'll use something else no really i mean it it, or the kitchen table you know so it's not uh yeah so did you yeah. notice was were there disposable plates and plastic forks no and no uh, throwaway cameras did your mom use cloth diapers or disposable diapers i don't remember <laughs> i hope for you her sake that, it, that in my case she used disposable ones <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no uh, plastic uh, plastic knives and forks. I remember it was a novelty thing to, uh, I think in the 70s or so, to have a little picnic basket, you know, with plastic knives and forks and plates in it. But they were not disposable. They were simply lightweight. Mm -hmm. That's why they were chosen, you know, yeah. because funny enough, that's the, the picnic basket didn't, didn't end up in the back of a Chevy Caprice. That picnic basket was used on the back of a bicycle. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you have, uh, you know, <laughs> glasses and, uh, or hiking or whatever, you know, if you have glasses and uh, and, uh, and ceramic plates and, and silverware and you go clink, 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 <laughs> down into the field to have a picnic, then the whole village. I know where he's going. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. so when you, when you yeah. went to a restaurant, would you take your picnic basket along? Or was that <clears throat> specifically for, well, okay, then the next question becomes, were there restaurants that were serving food on paper plates with plastic forks no. and that kind of thing? No, never. So never. And I've never seen glass tops on tables. Always linen. Always linen. Except outdoors. Lots of uh, uh, restaurants, especially in Austria and in, in the Alps and the they've got a little seating area outside, mm -hmm. maybe behind the house, behind the guest house or so. And there they would have a vinyl, usually uh, uh, yeah, a, a vinyl top, mimicking cloth, but that was sort of the cheaper things, simply to protect the wooden table underneath. But even there, that was 50-50%. Most of the other ones had also out there simply cheaper uh, cotton cloths as tablecloths. You know, so where it didn't matter if it, it if it rained on them, you know, or some many times if rain clouds would come, you would see the waiter or waitress run out and you know collect the cloths and fold them up inside, and rain comes, poof, and then when the sun comes out and it's dry, okay, out, poof, set the table. Again. <laughs> poof, yeah, poof, yeah, there's a lot of poof, poof, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were plastic shopping bags. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and and they were printed. They were uh, printed with the uh, let, let's say with well, the logo of the of the town and of the of the shop and so on. But if you get a plastic shopping bag, we had them for years. I mean, you so would you keep that. Over and over oh yes, again. my my mom had a drawer in the cabinet, and that's where she would put them in, and fold them up, and when she when shopping. You know, especially revisiting that store, you know, in order to show that she's a patron of that store. She likes going there. She would take it. See, I've got my bag with your logo and so on. And that's it. So it's interesting that to, to me that what has become a trend in terms of zero waste living and um, ways that we take care of the earth is the way it's been done in Europe kind of all along. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it has shifted some in the last 20 years mm -hmm. since you've lived there. But um, this idea that consumerism specifically aimed at disposables um, and deliberate obsolescence mm -hmm. is an American thing. And I think that's so intriguing. Um, and it contributes to this, this whole thing where Americans are, are using like 27% of the uh, resources that the world is putting out. And that's a pretty amazing number. Yeah. And then when you add in this coronavirus part into the mixture, and suddenly people who would never have dreamed of taking a Ziploc mm -hmm. bag and washing it out and using it again are doing so simply because it's to save a trip to the stores, to keep an essential worker from having to stock that item and from having, you know, e even if you have your groceries delivered, somebody is going through the store and picking them up, picking up the different items. So it's, it's intriguing to me how that is in some ways an American phenomenon. And we have kind of exported that whole idea that just use disposable, what could possibly be wrong with that? <laughs> then we yeah. end up with so many single use plastics and uh, one of the things that we discovered pretty quickly living in a tiny house was there's just not space for all of that stuff. There wasn't a drawer mm -hmm. for uh, foil and plastic wrap. And, and so we mm -hmm. would do things like um, 
you know, have a bowl with a, with a saucer on top. <laughs> and so we we found ways around using plastic wrap and foil and stuff like that. And we also have some um, silicone lids that we've used for years now. Mm-hmm. And we literally still have the foil and the plastic wrap that we had when we started the tiny house journey. We've not had to replace them because we just don't use it it's that really much. Funny. Yeah, it's, like, it's still there in the it's drawer. It's the amazing, mm-hmm. everlasting, you know, five years yeah. roll of cling film or whatever. I, I, may I throw <laughs> something in there? Of course. I'm not so sure if it's just an American thing. I, I think it uh, in. Uh, prove me wrong. It would be really interesting to hear, but I've got my own cute little theory in my little barrel, you know? Yeah. And that is that I think to a large extent we can, uh, I blame to a large extent actually the military for disposable stuff. Oh, interesting. Because for them, they go one direction and guys, all we want to bring back is you. We don't care about the stuff. You know, I mean, think oh, of, yeah, think so about all, all the, the the hundreds of tanks that are left behind in the Middle oh, wow, East yeah. and all over the place yeah. and trucks. And I remember it's too expensive to bring them home. Yeah, I remember reading about the history of the the Jeep, the World War Two Jeep, you know, that the army wrote out. You want this thing to have meet certain criteria. OK, that was four wheel drive, uh, easy to fix and blah, 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 you know, and then it spelled out life expectancy of one way one jeep in the field as soon as it lands 14 days it just has to last 14 days because they know by that time it either blew up got disabled fell in a rut done (laughs) you know so that you see nowadays still uh, world war ii jeeps lovingly restored and, and kept think about it this was a disposable machine Wow. You know? So do you think that we have, through our military, exported this kind of throwaway culture? I'm sorry, but I, once again, it's my own little crazy mind. But I see I see that everywhere. I mean, when, when the military goes somewhere, they build up barracks, they build up a temporary camp. OK, mm-hmm. so they OK, so they need from one tent to the next tent to the next tent they need power. Okay, let's put poles up and string string the electric and so Mm -hmm. on. What do we see in American towns everywhere? Electric strung up from pole to pole to pole to pole, you know? (laughs) It looks like a like an army camp, you know, it doesn't matter. It's got it's got uh, uh, pretty trees, uh, you know, that grow into the sewage lines and the power lines, you know, and, and other stuff underground. It doesn't matter that houses are built of bricks, you know, and every time a hurricane comes through, the power's out. Ice storm, power's out. Why is that? You know, because we don't take the time. Let's put it underground. You know, four feet, five feet, boom. You know. I, sorry, I, I think, yeah. Um, I think it is from the mentality of maybe also having to move on. Mm-hmm. You know, having to move on. Yeah. And and we read in in statistic. I remember when I first came here. You know, um, yeah, a little bit longer than a year ago, <clears throat> that that the real estate agent, when you were hunting for a house, said that the average American family stays in one location seven years. Because when I looked at the house, and I I, I remember looking at the first house, and I thought, you know, uh, th- this is a nice house, but this is not going to last, and this has been built poorly, and so on. And the lady said, don't worry about it. Don't look at that. If you are like every other average American person, you're only going to live in here seven years. Don't worry about this oh, not wow. lasting 10 years or 20 years or enough for your child to be grown up. So know? instead of buying a house, you're buying your fraction of use of the house. Yes. And then That's you get a, a completely 30, different mindset. Then you get a 30 year mortgage. <laughs> you get a full size price yes. tag. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and a house that you have a limited lifespan. Yeah. Okay. So in some ways, that deliberate obsolescence has also transferred into housing. Yeah. We're, we're getting a whole wild ride here through the whole idea of um, thriftiness, frugal living. 
and um, consumer, um, you know, deliberate wastefulness, um, disposability. We started out talking about how um, yeah. uh, Guile Slade says, not only did we, meaning Americans, invent disposable products ranging from diapers, cameras, contact lenses, but we invented the very concept of disposability itself. So we've kind of, for those of you who've just joined us, yeah. we've made a whole world trip from uh, European uh, ways of decorating. It's, I mean, this uh, idea yeah. of redecorating <laughs> maybe didn't exist so much. Uh, mm -hmm. You just decorated the house and you went with it. Yeah. And then um, I just learned that American military would make Jeeps that they expected to last 14 days. And so that's yeah. that's crazy level of disposability. And then but when he gets here to buy a house and yeah. the realtor says, don't worry about it. It's it only has to last you for the seven years you're going to be in the house. It's not here for good. But I, I must say, I think it has. That's a pretty amazing level of disposability. I think it has to do with uh, how likely is the community or other people, uh, how likely are the people to stay where they are mm -hmm. all their lives for generations to come? Or how likely are they to move on? to the next best thing, mm -hmm. to the next best job offer, or sorry, the company moves us yep. across the continent right. and stuff. You know, you need to be able to pick up and go. Mm -hmm. And and I think like so many people have written tons of books about how, why home is so important, mm -hmm. you know? And I think the, the, the visual aspect of coming into a house, um, it's very important. I think it would be more upsetting for a family that needs to move across the U.S. to go into an empty house, you know, um, uh, and stay there, not knowing, you know, when they move on or so in an empty place, uh, then fulfill their, their drive. Let's make this into a nest, mm -hmm. you know, and if we have the money, and if the pieces that look like it makes a nest are available, boom, kit it out, mm -hmm. you know? I mean... Never mind that it ends up being disposable. Unfortunately, it, it ends up because then later on, uh, yeah, suddenly there's a job offer overseas or something. And then there comes the... Co okay, can we take it with? No. What you would know? be the point? I mean, <laughs> Got yeah. it from Ikea, go to Ikea and, you know, wherever you're going to go. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, it's... a. Uh, yeah. So paper plates, plastic cutlery, K cups, burner phones, even disposable computers. Each American yeah. throws away 2,555 pounds of trash each year. The weight. That's the weight of a car. Of two grizzly bears. That's the weight of a car. It's heavier than my Opal. That's what we throw away each year. Can you imagine? I'm not going <laughs> to throw away my Opal. <laughs> well, I think we've established that. The car's not going anywhere. <laughs> That's because they're disabled. No, <laughs> no it works. It yes. works. It works. <laughs> yeah, no. But I think there's a new attention to uh, living frugally and living in a more earth friendly way yes. right now, thanks to the virus, because we are suddenly aware that our choices in terms of using that Ziploc bag once or washing it and using it again or, um, you know, foil or you name it um mm -hmm. this actually means somebody's gonna have to go back to the grocery and that's maybe not some a place that we consider a safe place anymore to get more disposable to get more disposable <laughs> you know that's unbelievable yeah so what's a way to um what's a way to live with less disposables i mean he's got a little project in the backyard right now that i think is a really great way of of addressing disposables you want to talk about it? Which one are you referring to? <laughs> There's Harold back there. <laughs> yeah, if you'd see your backyard, you'd realize what an open-ending question that <laughs> was. <laughs> Anything that's not on the roof is a project. <laughs> well, the roof is a project, too. Oh, Should yeah, I... that too, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I was talking about the garden. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. This that's is cool. a little harder for, for tiny house people who are actually intend to live here for a while, live there for a while, live someplace else for a while. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we did when we were living in our tiny house was that we had some things in pots 
And you yes. could literally bring the pot inside, stick it in the kitchen sink, um, um, wedge a few things around it, and off you can go. Yeah. Um, but for people oh. who are living in one place, um, one really great way to reduce your use of disposable stuff is to grow something. Yes. Um, grow that zucchini. We need to grow zucchini. Oh, yeah. We, We've got a patch we already ate, um, dedicated. <laughs> we had zucchini noodles and marinara sauce last evening. It was quite good. And you you also ground a, uh, a sweet potato in Yeah. It. Gosh, that was nice. Well, I've never grown sweet potatoes. We need to try that. So yeah. if the parking lot at, at the big box store is any indication, <laughs> there's a lot of people turning to gardens and a lot of people really yeah. maybe considering that who would not have considered it before. Time. Time is your one resource. Yeah. What are you going to do with it? And you know? that's where we'll leave it because that's the main question. And I love you. And I love you. That's the main answer. <laughs> Thanks for watching. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. The music is composed by William Kirkpatrick. Lyrics by Louisa Stead. Arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at CarmenShank.com.